Charles Egan, Dr. Charles Egan is professor at San Francisco State University where he teaches classical Chinese, Chinese language, is that right? Um, and he does master's classes in literature in translation, Chinese literature in translation. Actually, that's undergrad. The graduates, we do the original. original. Okay, so he teaches yeah. literature in translation for undergrads and literature in the original for graduate students. Right. He has published extensively on the evolution of Chinese classical poetic genres and is a frequent translator. His book, Clouds Thick, Whereabouts Unknown, Poems by Zen Monk of China, Monks of China, was awarded the 2011 uh, Lucerne Strike Prize in Asian Lit Translation by the American Literary Translators Association. His new book, which his talk today is coming from, Voices of Angel Island, Inscriptions and Immigrant Poetry, will be available in our library very soon. It's in the mail. <laughs> this is, a, we've been waiting for the softback. Good. <laughs> uh, it's a culmination of over a decade's work of researching wall inscriptions at the old immigration station in Angel Island in San Francisco. Dr. Egan has also um, taught at DRBU online, I, be I believe, at that time, ago, for the translation program. And again, this morning, I heard in the hallway. So we're very honored to have Dr. Egan with us today. I give it with the floor over to him. Let's give him a warm welcome. Well, thank you. And, and thank, thank you all for coming. Uh, well, first, let me ask all of our students over here, have you been to Angel Island? Anybody? Just a couple people, right? How about over here? Who's been to Angel Island? Just a couple people, right? Well, uh, Angel Island, this is, this is the way it looked in 1910 when it opened, right? Uh, and this is the administration building in the front with the hospital and then the barracks where all the inscriptions are today over here. This was a pump house. And then these were, these were, uh, were uh, uh, staff housing. Uh, to get, get, get another like view of the same thing. The staff housing up there, water tanks, and so on. The administration building uh, burned down in 1940. So it, it functioned as an immigration station from 1910 to 1940. But then it was taken over by the, by the US military. Because Angel Island also was, had, had a, a military base on it. So once the, once the administration building burned down, the immigration station itself was moved to San Francisco, and the army took over this 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 um, space, and then they used it for World War II prisoners, both enemy aliens, mostly from Hawaii, Japanese Hawaiians, and then also for for POWs, German, Italian, and and uh, and uh, 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 Japanese. So. Uh, what I want to do today is to give you sort of an overview of everything there. Those of you who have been there might, know, might have heard of Angel Island as a site for sort of Chinese immigrant pilgrimage. You know, it, it was a very important site for Chinese immigration. But that's not all it was. Basically, anybody who came in through the port of San Francisco to, uh, uh, to, to, get to, to reach the US who had problems with their papers and that could come for, from a variety, a variety of reasons, including ethnicity and, 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 and race, uh, would be sent to Angel Island for investigation, right? So let me sort of start up uh, by, with, with uh, the state of immigration today, right? You know, this is a very fraught period in the United States. There's a lot of anti-immigrant state uh, sentiment out there. We have detention camps on the border. Right, which is not so different than this one, right? Uh, and, and, and we have a lot of hot-headed re rhetoric, uh, you know, uh, directed against immigrants. But now, as before, it's really the same issues that have always been there. You know, we think of this Ellis Island experience as, as saying that, well, there was this period when immigrants were welcome. Immigrants were never very, very welcome, actually, you know, here. Uh, uh, if you, you were welcome if you were Northern European Protestants, you know, uh, you know, in, in the early periods. Even Benjamin Franklin, you know, our great man, in a pamphlet once warned against allowing people of swarthy complexion to enter the United States. 
he, his worry focused part, particularly on Germans, because believing those immigrating to the United States were generally of the most ignorant, stupid sort of their own nation. That's Benjamin Franklin's talking, right? So you see, it goes back you know, a, a pretty long way. The, the reasons for anti-immigrant state sentiment then, certainly in the 19th century and now, uh, are really the same. Distrust of the other, anybody from another place, right? Uh, racial, racial, ethnic, religious bias, right? And then the fear that immigrants will take away American jobs. You know, so it's always the same arguments over and over again. Uh, in my research, I've studied a lot of this, and then you hear what people are saying today, and it's, it's the same. It's the same. So, so uh, what we want to do is to is to uh, uh, sort of contextualize some of some of that sentiment with the lived experience of immigrants who actually came here, the reasons they came here, and and what their own feelings were about it. So for for this project, I. Uh, I um, uh, was studying inscriptions that were found in the in the barracks, which is over, over which is right 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 there, right at the old dining room there, administration building, and so on. Now we, we think of we, we often think of it as being primarily Chinese, but really people from eighty nations showed up, you know, or eighty or eighty one, I think. Uh, had been recorded going through Angel Island. Uh, the total number of people who, was, who were kept there is hard to estimate, but it could be, all to uh, in total, uh, about a half a million people went through the Angel Island Immigration Station. Uh, in the 1910 to, 19, 19, 10 to 1940 period, you know, 100,000 Chinese, 85,000 Japanese, 8,000 Russians, 8,000 Asian Indians, mostly six from the Punjab. Uh, and uh, a thousand Koreans, a thousand Filipinos, 400 Mexicans were all held at Angel Island pending investigation. But, though, but these were the immigrants who were coming because the Angel Island Immigration Station was also the main deportation center for, for, uh, for uh, this region of California. And it was also used as a, uh, a, a, as a place for federal prisoners before, the, before Alcatraz was, was built. Right, so there could be some prisoners there. And then in World War II, enemy aliens, as I say, mostly Japanese Hawaiians, right? And then uh, the, uh, the various uh, POWs were also held. So all told, about a half million people. Almost every group that went through left inscriptions on the walls, right? Uh, either carved into the walls or penciled on the walls. And many of those can still be read today. So, so what my book is about is, is a collection of as many of these inscriptions as I could find that had not been previously translated. Uh, and then trying to put them into uh, you know, English for read readability, but also research them to try to get the backstories of as many things as I could. Right? Now, the immigration experience tended to begin on shipboard because um, uh, you know, uh, the immigration inspectors would go to the trans-Pacific trans steamers and do the initial, you know, uh, uh, work there. And, you know, uh, as you might expect, the first-class passengers, mostly, would be landed immediately. They would not, not have to go anywhere, right? Uh, you know, wealth and power have, always have a little bit of uh, influence. Uh, uh, you know, and, and, and many others would be also be landed immediately. But those who, those who were deemed to require investigation were sent to Angel Island. Now, for, for Chinese, uh, China, China had already uh, instituted the Exclusion Act in 1882, right? So there, there, was, there was actually a, a, a legal basis to try to exclude Chinese immigrants at that time. So they were autom almost automatically sent to Angel Island. The Japanese, um, there were, after 1907, there were some rules of, of the road decided between the U.S. government and the Japanese government. They could still be sent there for medical examination or, for, or sometimes for immigration purposes, uh, but they tended to be there, there very much shorter. Uh, but, 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 uh, but picture brides 
we'll talk, get, get into them in a minute, we're, we're all sent to Angel Island. And, 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 uh, and, and so that, that, that's its own story, which we'll, we'll, we'll leave for, for a bit later. Uh, but a lot of Russians would end up there. A lot of, a lot of any, people from anywhere, if, if, if they, were, they, they, they didn't meet certain criteria for immediate landing, a, lo, a big one would be uh, money. Are they likely to become a public charge? Or they end up on the welfare rolls, they could be excluded, that kind of thing. So we'll get into some of those specifics as we go along. So what we have down here is the, is the little Angel Island steamer. The Angel Island steamer would pick up passengers who were being sent from the ships and then take them around to Angel Island. Uh, and uh, um, uh, here we have a couple youngsters. Uh, and he, so you see, you see like all, all of the, uh, the, um, uh, the steamers were, you know, were, I mean, all, all of the, uh, the, the liners were, were embarked here and then, and then the, the steamer would take them about and the Angel Island immigration stations about here pay, facing Richmond and, and, and Berkeley, that area. Uh, here's where they have actually arrived, and you can see the steamers there, right? And there was an old uh, uh, pier with a baggage house on that side. And so all, the, all of them would come straight out right into the administration building for processing, right? And you can see as people of every, every nationality uh, were, were, were coming, coming together, but then once they got to the station, it was all separated by ethnicity, right? There were Chinese dormitories and there were European dormitories. There was the Asian dining hall and the European dining hall. You know, we have to remember that, that this period uh, of uh, American history was very much, immigration law was in large part dictated by eugenics. You know what eugenics is? You know, it's like the purity of the blood, right? And really it was, it was, it was, uh, it was uh, uh, putting the, the premier status for Northern Europeans, right? And then other races, you know, in law were considered to be inferior or defective, right? Uh, actually, without naming names, I think there's, there's a, a politician out there now who talks about immigrants poisoning the blood of our country. That's eugenics, right? You know that it's like it's like a hundred years old. What, what what we've been hearing, right? So so in any case, uh, uh, this place was not necessarily a welcoming place, and it certainly wasn't a very welcoming place for Asians, right? Uh, because they, the uh, the authorities were either using legal means or medical means, uh, looking for reasons to exclude people, right? Uh, uh, and, and, and you know, and and it was thought it was thought by um, by, by, by many people that uh, um, uh, people from Asia in particular or other parts of the world were bringing tropical diseases to the U.S. So, so the, in the medical field, they were looking for things like trachoma of the eye, right? Or hookworm is another big one or liver flukes, or one thing after another. And some of those things were quite endemic. And they, frankly, you know, they're not, they're, they're, it's not, not, nothing you can catch, right? But it was just, it was used as a marker of, you know, of, 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 uh, of a tropical disease, which we're trying to keep out. Here's the administration building. And people would go in for pre preliminary processing, right? Uh, uh, you know, uh, names, dates, you know, and so on. And then setting, setting up sort of uh, a schedule for interviewing. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, these are Chinese women, uh, along with uh, De Deaconess Catherine Maurer, who, who, would, who was spent, spent like 30 years there helping the immigrants. She was quite a, a saintly figure. Uh, and then, then you'd go to the hospital. And the hospital was where you would have this, have this, uh, this examination, again, Separate, there were actually separate doors for Asians and Europeans, you know, in this place. And so, 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 the, so you, they go in and then the examination itself was quite humiliating for many people, uh, especially from Asian countries who hadn't encountered Western medicine, right? 
So, so you know, they, you know, here you have somebody like, like checking out somebody's eyes, looking for trachoma, pre, 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 uh, presumably. They would also have to give um, fecal samples in a bowl, which would then be tested for hookworm, you know, and various other things. Uh, then they would have to, you know, to be in, inspected. They would be stripped and inspected by the doctors to see if they had had the uh, the medical clearance to continue with their with their uh, their uh, 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 applications. In the early days, if you failed that, they just put you on a boat and you and you were sent you back, right? Uh, the the when you bought a when you when you bought a a, a ticket from a from a Trans Pacific liner. The, the companies were obligated, if somebody was not landed, to take them back. Because in those days, there was no such thing as a visa, right? All of the immigration uh, processes took place here, right? So you just want to go to America. You jump on a boat. You come here and see if they let you in. And if they don't, then they send you back, right? Right. Uh, uh, so, 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 you know, it wasn't until 1924 that actually the idea of a visa system was created, which meant that you had to get permission before you embarked from your home country to come to this, to come to this country. Well, once, once they got the medical exam and now they're waiting for their investigation, the dormitories were three bunks high, up to 200 people per room, right? For the, for the, 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 the two Chinese dormitories were the biggest, Chinese-Asian dormitories were the biggest, 200 and 190. And then the European uh, dormitories on the other side of the building, there were two of those. They were about 60 bucks each. And they were, there was a couple sitting rooms and recreation rooms also that people could, could uh, visit. As I said, that there were two different mess halls, Asian and European. Uh, in, the, in the Asian, there were actually multiple food fights in the in, in, in the dormitories over the years of, of immigrants protesting how awful the food was uh, uh, and so so the the pretty soon the the station did hire Chinese cooks to cook you know uh, cook 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 you know still was terrible really bad food but at least it was sort of um, uh, identifiable right but then the Japanese hated eating that stuff Right. This we can't, you know, we can't do this, right? You know? So, so, the, so the, there was a lot of controversy about that. Uh, the 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 uh, recreation yards were separated, also, right? So here's the Chinese yard and the European yard, and here Russians in the recreation yard yard about 1915. Why Russians? Russians came across the Pacific in large numbers, because by the time the uh, Angel, Angel Island was opened. The Trans-Siberian Railway had, was also open, right? So, 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 so you know, people and, and this and a lot of this in the early period was during World War One. So there were a lot of people who left Russia, took the Trans-Siberian to to Vladivostok, and then the Russians had also helped to build the railway through Manchuria, right? That ends up down in the Liaodong Peninsula. So that the city of Harbin in, 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 in present-day China was largely a Russian city way back then, right? So that, so that there were actually quite a lot of Russians who came through here. And there's still a pretty large Russian community in San Francisco uh, from that. Um, a few more pictures here. Picture brides. I mentioned picture brides. Uh, 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 following the, uh, the um, uh, agreements between the U.S. and, and, and Japanese governments. They're called the, the Gentlemen's Agreements, right? 1907 to 1908. What had happened was that up until, you know, uh, that time, Japanese immigration was fairly free, right? And there were quite a lot of people who came to Hawaii, and then from Hawaii, then they came here, right? Many of them farmers. You know, they came from farming communities in, in you know, in, in Japan, which were suffering because under the, under under the uh, the Meiji Emperor's sort of reform project, pro, pro, uh, projects, was to reform agriculture and make it more sort of uh, uh, industrialized. That put a lot of family farmers out of work, right? And that led to a lot of farm farming people. You know, from Hiroshima from uh, Kumamoto, from uh, 
uh, several other uh, provinces to, to essentially go to Hawaii as as um, uh, uh, pineapple workers, you know, and, and cane, you know, su sugar cane workers, and some of them then made the step here. Uh, but but you know, California, we think of California as quite a welcoming place today, right? And it is. It wasn't then, right? California was the was the seat of some of the of, of the worst racism in this country, right? Uh, and it was mostly directed against Chinese and Japanese, right? That that the Ch Chinese began to move over here after the gold uh, after the gold rush, right? Bef you know, before in 1849, there were almost almost nobody from China had come. And then 1849, you get like a few hundred. 1850, you get a thousand. 1851, you get 20,000 people coming over. And and after a while, up to a up to a quarter or a third of all the miners, you know, like looking for gold, in in, in California, were from China, right? And there was big pushback from from the you know from the uh, the, the natives, I, I wouldn't call them native Californians because actually many of them were immigrants too from other places. But white, the white uh, 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 miners pushing back against the Chinese, and there was a lot of bias. There was also violence, and then then came legal legal uh, impediments. There were miners' taxes that were present, put put only on on Asians, for example. They had to pay per year. Uh, and uh, and uh, um, uh, th th uh, there was an anti Cooley Act of 1862 uh, uh, to protect free white labor against competition with Chinese Cooley labor and to discourage the immigration of the Chinese into the state of California. And this imposed a head tax on everybody who was here. Uh, then 1875, the Page Act. So California and the, and the other Western states were pressuring the US government to make much more strict immigration laws to keep out the Asian, Asian people, right? And the U.S. complied. It, it, was, it was sort of a touch and go or, or, or a, um, a slow process because the U.S. government wanted to keep avenues open with the Chinese and Japanese governments, for example, because of international trade, you know? So, so if, they were, if they were to do something you know, overly harsh here, that could impact, you know, the, 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 uh, the U.S. interests abroad. But eventually, uh, the, the Congress became part of this, a part of this process. 1875 uh, was the Page Act. And the Page Act was, was forbade the importation of Asian laborers of any kind. And then, you know, and, and that, and that, that's, that was sort of followed up by various other laws later. But it also uh, put a uh, special um, um, uh, rule about Asian women who wanted to come. And it, it, what, what it was said, because there's so, such, so little trust, is it was to prevent Asian women coming for the, pro, for, for, for the purposes of prostitution, right? OK, well, that's bad enough, right? But to make the matters worse, part of the law was that any Asian woman who wanted to come had to get a certificate from the U.S. consul saying that they were that they were, you know, uh, not coming for the you know not coming for the purposes of prostitution. What's that mean? That means that that now the U.S. government officials are policing sexuality, you know, poli policing private issues. So as a result. No Chinese woman came, you know, uh, you know, in those. So, so the, the people who were coming were mostly male immigrants coming to make money, hoping to go back home, right? Uh, and then 1880, uh, another one. 1882 was the Chinese Exclusion Act. We'll, we'll go into more detail in that a little bit later. For for for, for, for the Japanese was the Gentlemen's Agreement, which was, what was which was exclusion without going quite so far as exclusion. Instead. Like uh, the Japanese residents here, and there were many, mostly in farming, uh, um, uh, were then by California authorities being forced to take their kids out of regular schools and put them into a school with Chinese children as an, as an all-Oriental school or Asian school in San Francisco. 
and that and, and other, some other uh, 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 incidents brought a lot of pushback from the Japanese government. Because the Jap remember the, one difference between the Japanese government and the Chinese government at this time, the Japanese government was strong, right? By 1905, 1907, they'd already beaten the Chinese in the, in, 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 in the Sino-Japanese War. They beat the Russians in the, in, in, in the, in, in the, uh, the uh, Russo-Japanese War, right? They were a power in Asia, right? So they couldn't be messed with so much as, as like the Chinese government which was fairly weak, could be. So, uh, so, so Teddy Roosevelt, the president, and the Japanese government got together for this agreement. They said, OK, well, here, here's what we'll do. We, uh, ja the Japanese government will voluntarily not give um, exit visas to new laborers from Japan who want to come here. Right? Uh, uh, but, uh, the U.S. government said, "Okay, well, those who th those who are already here can stay. They they will they, they can, can they can maintain their their permanent residency here, right? And so that was sort of, sort of the status, um, sort of maintaining the status quo in a way. But it led to one big, uh, not uh, uh, to the U.S. side unexpected uh, 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 result." that most of these Japanese farmers here were, had come alone. You know, they, they were here making money with the idea of going back to Japan. Most of them had not been married. So what was happening, this created what we call the picture brides, right? And so, so their families back in Japan would find them a suitable, suitable bride, right? And, 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 you know, at, to, and then marry them in absentia. You know, the, the, like so that the couple has only has never actually met. They've only they, they've only uh, exchanged maybe photographs, which is why they're called picture brides, right? And and uh, and 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 the and the Japanese government actually oversaw the process to make sure that it was legit. So, for example, the the family of the of the of the groom would have to put the woman on their family register for at least six months in Japan, right, to show that it was legit. And then the government also required the grooms to have at least $800 in savings, right, to show that they could support, support a family, right? And so, so between 1910 and 1920, about 6,000 picture brides came through Angel Island, right, who had never met their parent, never met their grooms. Uh, it was actually, yeah, you know, there's a lot of pain at Angel Island, but this is actually one of the more happy things in that in that the, the Angel Island immigration authorities required that when the picture brides arrived, they come to Angel Island, then they made the grooms come in person to pick them up, right? So that the, the, the bride and, brides and groom met at the Angel Island immigration station, right? right? So it's quite, quite a fascinating story, right? Uh, here, are, here are picture brides signing up. Here are some more. Uh, the, the, the first influx of people from South Asia were, were six from the Punjab, right? And of course, of course, six, six were turbans, right? Uh, and that caused a whole total furor in the U.S., in, in California, because they were other, you know? And so, the, so there were these, these, these passionate anti-immigration diatribes in the newspapers against the so-called Hindu hordes, even though six are not Hindus, you know, but that's what they were, would be called. Uh, uh, so, so actually, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, immigration by this group was, was fairly uh, circumscribed fairly quickly. Then comes the Board of, board of Inquiry. And for many people, this would be fairly perfunctory, right? You know, you basically show your papers and so on and so forth. For the Chinese, this was not perfunctory at all because of some, an interesting um, sort of uh, sort of side effect uh, of, of of the California earthquake, right? Because a, a lot of a lot of um, uh, Chinese originally came here as laborers in the 19th century, and many of them stayed. Some of them went back, but many of them stayed, and they started in small businesses or whatever else. They worked in the railroads. Uh, 
um, but you know, and you know, and then and then some were coming for more business purposes. You know, in the late 19th century. Well, um, uh, in those days, you could not become a citizen if you were Asian. Right? Naturalization was not uh, not allowed for Asians until 1943. Right? Uh, uh, and so, so, uh, so, so, uh, you know, the, the, these were the, they were they were resident Chinese in the states, right? But then the earthquake happens. Then the earthquake happens, and what happens is all the records get burned. All of the immigration records were burned. So after the earthquake, a lot of of the Chinese community uh, uh, took advantage of this situation. And they, there was a process set up that as long as you had a couple of guarantors who had to be usually, they, they, they could be technically anybody, but usually they had to be white, right? To guarantee, oh yes, I know, I know Sam, he was born here, right? And he would then get citizenship. And once you had citizenship, you could call for your relatives from, from China to join you as, as, as reunification of a family. In between 1910 and 1940, that's how most of the Chinese through Angel Island came here, right? Right. They were they were they came either as children, or or spouses of Chinese U.S. citizens, or pretending that they were, and those are called paper sons, paper daughters, right? Uh, so so the the, the 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 immigration hearing was particularly difficult for the for the uh, the um, uh, uh, authorities because. There were no records, so what did they do? They well, they would inter they would interview people separately. So they'd interview the immigrant and then inter interview the supposed father, right, uh, or family member, and ask them detailed questions about their village, right? Like so, a question on this hearing might be something like, uh, uh, were there two windows or three in the front of your house in the village? You know, did you have a dirt floor or a wooden floor? You know, uh, where was the where was the uh, you know the uh, the fish pond in your village? You know, uh, or they'd ask you about your relatives. You know, like your third uncle such and such. What's his name? And then they would actually just have to match the stories, and that was the basis they used to to decide who would be able to to, to be landed and who would not. It's, it was really kind of crazy. So. So whether whether people were coming uh, legally or not, every almost everybody uh, uh, memorized what they call chat books or prompt books, where they had all the answers to these questions, right? They'd memorize them, and if they if they were smart, they would throw them overboard before they landed. But we still do have a few of these things out there. They're they're artifacts that are that are wonderful to see. Uh, the first book that brought Angel Island to prominence was was called Island, uh, Poetry and History of Chinese Immigrants on Angel Island, 19, 19, 19, 1940, by Judy Young, Him Mark Lai, and Jenny Lim. This is the second edition. It's really quite a, a, a worthwhile book to look at. It's focused only on the Chinese side of things. And it's a combination of some of the poems from the walls and then oral histories by people who had gone through Angel Island. Right. Uh, so what I did when I was doing my book is I tried not to re uh, repeat anything that had been done there. I was doing all of the poems that had not already been published. Now they were very lucky. They had uh, uh, they didn't have to read everything from the walls, you know, like 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 I did, you know, and, and my, my my colleagues did. Uh, instead, they uh, they had uh, uh, manuscripts that were written down by immigrants because the immigrants thought these poems were really interesting. Right, and so there were two of them who wrote down, copied poetry, and and then the authors of this book in the 1930s, and the authors of this book were, were uh, had access to those, which helped them create the texts that they have. Another great book uh, by Erica Lee Judy Young. This is a history book of all of the different groups that went through Angel Island. There's a chapter on each, uh, and I, I sort of followed that same uh, that same. Uh, 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 structure in my book. So I have, a, I have Japanese, Korean, Chinese, and then others, like Europeans, other, other groups, and then World War II. And here's my book here. 
Okay, so let's look at some of the Chinese inscriptions, what's actually there. As I say, Chinese wrote poetry on the walls. There's some other things too, but they wrote poetry on the walls. And why? Well, in China, um, public poetry was a thing. It was actually a, it was actually a time-honored thing. That, you know, uh, those of you who've been anywhere in China, you know that putting a, na putting a name and calligraphy in front of every sort of major site's important, you know? Like you're naming it, you're, you're not only naming it, but sometimes you're saying something auspicious, right? You're bringing some auspiciousness to this to this site. The same same thing would go for for Chunlian, you know, the spring couplets you put around by your door at Chinese New Year time, right? It's important to have those words because they're bringing the good fortune along with them, right? It's something to do with uh, that with a worldview in which. Heaven, earth, and man are, 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 are a combination, tendi red, right? So the human um, imprint on nature is also a time-honored thing. You'll find that if you go like, to, to, to natural sites in China, you'll often see calligraphy carved on cliffs. You know, a, a beautiful mountain's great. A beautiful mountain with a calligraphy by Li Bo, or li, like the poet Li Bai, is even better. You know, because now we can understand how we should appreciate this thing. You see what I mean? So, so that's that was public poetry. A second kind of public poetry was poetry of uh, protest, right? Because uh, you know, China was has always been an authoritarian place, and, but it also had a Confucian tradition of scholars who, while obedient to the laws and to their superiors, also were Confucians and had their own their own. A sense of, of of righteousness, you know, and prop propriety, and if they felt that things were not going correctly, writing a poem was a very time honored time honored uh, way of of reacting to it, right? So what we have here, that's why, like for 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 decades, people in in, in Angel Island immigration states were writing poetry on the walls. Other groups didn't do it so much. Right, because they don't have that same tradition, but that doesn't mean that they weren't writing poetry about this experience. So in my book, you know, I, I, you know, like the Japanese and the and the uh, the Korean inscriptions you find there are pretty mundane names and dates, but they were publishing poetry in newspapers, right? Often about the same kinds of uh, terms. So I included a, quite a lot of those in my in my book as well. So we've already gone through this a little bit. Uh, this is the Exclusion Act, repeal, not repealed until 1943, during World War II. Uh, uh, even after that, uh, immigration by, uh, by Asians, or by most places, by most countries, frankly, was m very, very few because there was a quota system. I think from 1943 until the, until the uh, Immigration Act of 1964, uh, the quota for China was like 106, 106 people per year, right? Whereas it was, it's not really the, the, our modern America and the, the multicultural Americas began in 1964, you know, when, when the, the, the gates were opened and, and there were many more ways for people to, people to come here, right? Here's the text of the, of the, of the, uh, of the, of the uh, uh, Exclusion Act itself. Uh, before uh, the Angel Islands uh, Immigration Station was built, there was still a detention facility. This was in San Francisco on one of the wharfs where the liners came across the Pacific. And it said, this is all hearsay, but it said there was poetry in there too. But it's of course long gone, we can't see that anymore. Uh, the calligraphy in Angel Island is really quite good. Uh, it's surprisingly good. Uh, when we think of Chinese immigration, sometimes people like immediately think of the of the laborers coming for the for building the railroads, right? Who were mostly uneducated, you know, laborers. But that's not the group that came through Angel Island, right? Because in Angel Island, we already had the exclusion acts, and so, and so, and so, it was get difficult to get in. You had to have these connections, right? Uh, and and you're trying to prove that you're a relative of a U.S. citizen. So most of them came as merchants. You know, they said they're joining their father's business. Right? Many of them were still very young, but they all came. But they all came from really small villages. Uh, the vast, vast majority of of Chinese immigrants who came were from five counties, all 
near Guangzhou, right? Right. There's there's the cult, the so-called Si uh, Yi or Sei Yang, right? Which is uh, Tai Shan, which is what we get Tai Shan Hua, you know, Tai Shan, Enping, Kaiping, and uh, there's one more I forget, and then and then. Hmm? And then, and, then, and, then, and then also, slightly further away, but not very far, is from Xiangshan, which is now known as Zhongshan County, right? They're all in that place. This is the Pearl River, the Pearl River Delta part. It was very poor at the time, and, but it was also close to Hong Kong, where the steamers, or where the, where the liners began. And, and the way immigration's always worked in this country is one person comes, they write a letter home, say, hey, it's pretty good here, and then two people, two more people come, and they write letters home, and it, gets, and it sort of goes from there. So you end up, you end up, in, you know, like in, in this in the early 1900s, that large numbers of people from these old, old, from these same villages had all actually come here, and they maintained the connections with, with, with people back home. So, so the the people who came often were like the smartest kids in their village, you know, because they're the ones that the family thought could make it here. And they all, and they, and they, and they, many of them had a pretty decent education, at least like to a high school level. But it's a very traditional education, right? And so he, this, this calligraphy, this blocky, great style of calligraphy, he, and, and all, and most of the other calligraphy there is, is, is based on Chinese woodblock, woodblock printed books of the 19th century, right? Uh, and sort of for convenience, we can sort of put the calligraphy in two styles. This one, the blockier style, this is by the, uh, the Tang Dynasty general, uh, Yan Zhenqing, right? And you see, you see the, 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 he has blocky monumental strokes, but, but the strokes are such that the curves and the, and the, and the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the straight parts are sort of in a tension with one another, built around this image, imaginary square, right? So that, you know, the, the, these things, uh, they look like there's there's energy to them. They're about to break apart, almost. Right? Uh, 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 you see you see that this is very, really quite similar. Particularly, look at that character to, uh, compared compared to what he's doing here. And then and then another style is much more slender, still still strong and sinewy and tough, right? But but uh, but uh, uh, not as monumental, not as fleshy as the Yan Zhenqing style. And this is analogous to another Tang, Tang writer, uh, Liu Gongquan, right? Liu Gongquan, you see, you see it right here. Okay, so uh, uh, some some of the the uh, the poet of uh, poetry there is written in what we call a Xing Shu, like a, a running style, which is which is more of a curse, all closer to cursive, where you're running strokes together, and it's much more individualized. And this is a very good example. If you look, for example, this is the this is the character of Guo Jia Duo. Here. This is Zhu Guo, Zhu Guo Luan Wei, right? Uh, you, you see, it's you see, it's it's one stroke almost. You're going all the way through through a particular character. So let's take a look at a few of the poems that were in the original book, the Island Book, right? And here is Ju Luo Ogan, right? Uh, hard for me to read here. Uh, Ru Chen Island, Bu uh, Zi Yao. Uh, hard to see. I can actually probably read it better from here. I've got it in here too. Translation program. Translation program. Get to work. Get to work. Yeah, here it is. Here it is. So. Actually, you, here we'll do it this way instead. This, this makes it easier. <laughs> so, Ritu Ailun Zi Yo, Xiao Ran Shen Shi, Hun Jian Jian Qiu, Lao Sao Man Fu Ping Shi Xie, Kui Lei Cheng Qiu, Xie Jiu Fu, Li Wu Yin Xu, Yin Guo Luo, Dao Chan Xiao Chang Xiao Chang, Wei Wei Fu Qiu, Xian Lai Bie Yo Shu Fang Xiang. For days I've been without freedom on island, 
in reduced circumstances now I mingle with the prisoners. Grievances fill my belly, I rely on poetry to express them. A pile of clods bloat my chest and I wash it with wine. Because my country is weak, I have become aware of the laws of growth and decay. In pursuit of wealth, I have come to understand the principles of expansion and diminution. When I am idle, I have this wild dream that I have gained the Western barbarians' consent to enter America. Right. Uh, this is actually a, a good example to start with because, because there's, there's similar sentiments that come out in a lot of the poetry. Sometimes it's homesickness, right? Sometimes it's just despair of being locked up. Sometimes it's anger at the West. And sometimes it's also anger at China for being so weak. And that caused me to be in this position, right? So, so it's reflecting back on the, uh, on the, uh, the experience of colonialism. Uh, here's another lovely one. This is Zhongqiu Oka. This is about about Zhongqiu Jie, about Mid Autumn Festival. So Ye Liang Jiang Guo Jie Tuang Zhong, Chuang Qin Yue Jie Tou Zhao Nong, Men Lai Qi Li Han Chuan Xia, Chou Ba Shi Ji Yi Qiu Zhong, Wu Jia. This is this is more more day in Cantonese. Yeah, Cantonese. Yeah. Ye Yin Da Tong Jin Shang. So the night is cool, it's cool as I lie on the bunk before the window, the moon lady shines. Before bored, I get up and stand beneath the cold window. Sadly, I count the time that's elapsed. It's already mid-autumn. We should all honor and enjoy her, but I have not prepared even the most trifling gift that I feel is there. Right. Uh, we'll skip over that one. Uh, this one, very hard to see. Uh, but fortunately, they had it. They had it in their manuscripts, and this is actually one of the most beautiful poems. There, it's about somebody who died. There were there were quite a number of, of immigrants who died at the station, either of illness, and in a few cases of suicide. Right. Um, uh, but this is this is a this is somebody writing about his fellow villager, who had come, who had died of illness at the building. Right. So he says, shocking news reached my ear. We mourn you. When will they wrap your corpse for, 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 for return? You cannot close your eyes. Whom are you depending upon to voice your complaints? Right, right. Uh, thinking of the village, one can only futilely face the terrace for, terrace for gazing homeward. The Wang Xiangtai actually was in mythology. It was a place in the underworld after one had passed where, where you could turn back and look at the world of the living before you go down. You know, uh, go, you know, go down uh, to the underworld, right? Uh, but quite, it's quite beautiful. There's actually two of these like that. Here, just to show you, some, to show you a few oddities. The building, the building, was damaged and also was altered, right? So some of the poems you can't read anymore. Uh, we, but we were lucky that they were, had been written down in the 1930s. This is a poem from the island, translate, you know, island collection. But the whole middle part of it's just been has has been. Uh, destroyed by water damage, right? Here's one of my favorites. You've got a poem that starts over here and it finishes over here, right? And that's because during World War II, when this was used as a, bar as, as a POW barracks, they put a wall up, right? Like a wall across the, the, one of the dormitories, splitting it into two, right? There's also, an, uh, there's also a wonderful one. I don't have a picture of it. There's somebody who carved a poem backwards, you know, which is, Nobody can quite figure it out. Maybe you could say you could take prints of it. I don't know. Here's another favorite of mine. It says, the, uh, the title is over there. It's like random thoughts on having malaria, right? But then only the first character of each line shows up because the door was added later and they cut out the, the, whole, the whole, uh, whole poem. Uh, this is one of my favorites and I was very proud of finding it. Um, uh, it's a, just a big hole in the wall. But if you look closely enough, there are a few in, faint imprints of characters right here, right? And I was able to match them to see, you can see them there? They're very, very faint. But I was able to match them to this poem from Aunt from Island. So this is all that's left right here. And all of the rest has been destroyed. But, but we, we can still tell for sure the poem was there. Uh, now let me read, read you a few poems that, that are from my book. Let's see if I can get in here here. Let's see. 
I'll just read the English for some of these. I can find it. There we go. So, Sunyi Yunshan Qingyi So. Clouds and hill, hills all around, a single fresh color. Time slips away and cannot be recaptured. Although the feeling of spring is everywhere, how can we fulfill our heartfelt wish? Li Bie Xiang Qing, Xu Yi Jiu, Shi Zhi Liu Luo, Wu Lou Qiu. It's been a long time since I left my home village. Who could know I'd end up imprisoned in a, a wooden building? I'm heartsick when I see my reflection. My handkerchief is ho soaked in tears. I ask you, what crime did I commit to deserve this? This next one is very Confucian oriented. So it's about probably some older immigrant trying to teach the youngsters a bit of a lesson, right? Uh, it's useless to become friends with those of narrow mind. It's useless to have wealth if one disdains the poor. It's useless to show off one's cleverness in daily affairs. Understanding human nature all comes from learning. Attention, attention to details leads one to the proper way. This one's about actually, oh yeah, this one, this one. Uh, there's actually six poems by a single immigrant in one of the, in one of the rooms there. And this, is, this one and the next one are both from that. Uh, Dwelling in the wooden building, I give in to despair. Between high hills and the fairy pier, my brows furrow in pain. Letters do not arrive, my thoughts hopeless. In bitterness and sadness, I watch for my early release. Right, so that's more on the homesickness side, the sadness side. This one's more on the anger side. He says, he says um, I'm distressed our ancestral land is in such peril slashed and gouged for over 200 years by the colonial powers, right? Uh, compatriots must renew their will to strengthen the country. The Chinese from then on will have no sadness. And this one is, let's see, which one's this? It's hard for Chinese to come to America. There's so much sadness in this place. The foreign slaves have always bullied and cheated our country. When the people are rich and strong, we'll destroy the foreign lands. That's the anger side coming out. Right. I think we'll skip over that. Right. Oh, th let's do this one, though. This, one, this one's pretty cool. He says, uh, where'd it go? Where'd it go? Yeah, this one. This one. This was written in rather colloquial language, rather, rather you know, like Cantonese sounding. And it's about somebody who's really angry because somebody stole his money. Right? So he says, when leaving home, don't show your wealth to prying eyes. In my pants, I also had silver dollars. I hung the pants on the bed without a care. In a flash, they were stolen, and I'm so angry I cannot speak. I'm heartsick for my mother who sold everything for me. That bastard son of a turtle is so barbaric. Besides the Chinese poems, there's also illustrations all over the building, which are quite lovely to see. So uh, this was, was from the hospital, a lovely, lo a lovely sketch in the hospital. Uh, also in the hospital, like actually carved into the wall, <laughs> little cartoon figures, fish. There, there are quite a few fish actually. What, one thing, I, uh, I'm not a psychologist, but it seems to me that some of the pictures, they tend to be like fish, um, there's a horse, uh, there are birds. It's all things that can fly away, whereas the immigrants were stuck, you know, in Angel Island immigration station. So fish, here's some, bo some birds, ships for getting away. Of course, many of, these, many of these, they were young men from, mostly young, right? Probably less under 20, most of them, from China. Probably the biggest thing, biggest experience of their lives is taking the steamer, you know, or take, taking the, uh, the, the liner across. There's a bird looking at the moon. 
More fish. I think these might be whales. I'm not sure. There's a horseman. That's a lovely little horse there, running horse. Rifles. Pistols. Pistols. Flags. And this one's interesting because it's the American flag here. Uh, the original Chinese national flag doesn't look the way it does now, right? Either in mainland or in Taiwan, right? The, the original flag was simple stripes. There, there were like five stripes to represent the five nationalities of, of Chinese people, right? So I think it, this, this, that is the original Chinese flag along with the American flag together. Flags. Uh, this is a good luck symbol in the shape of an old Chinese coin. Right, so so for everybody, world money, you know, because they were all coming here to make their fortunes. And two of the most interesting uh, 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 pictures there are actually altars for the Qingming festival, for the for the tomb sweeping day, because you know here we have all these people who are stuck in detention, sometimes for months at a time. Right. Uh, the, it could be anywhere for Chinese. It could be anywhere from two weeks to months. The longest person who ever longest um, detention of a Chinese immigrant here was 762 days. Right. Right. But so but so both down the first floor, then on the second floor, these altars were carved so that people could continue their ancestral worship sacrifices on Qingming festival even though they were in prison, right? So this one's a little hard to see, but down below there's a basket, and then there's, there's flags, see? And then there's a stone stele with, with writing on it. Above here is, a, is a, a, a globe, and then banners going on, on either side. The one upstairs is much grander. It's actually about three feet high. And it was, that, it, that it was considered important to people was clear because there's no other inscriptions near it. You know, they, they, people have left this alone, right? Um, and I've done a, I did a, um, uh, uh, a line drawing of it so you can see it better, right? So you, see, so you see up at the top you have butterfly, right? Standing on a stone or wooden stele, right? Uh, and, then it, and, then, and then that's inserted in a basket and then there's these the banners going off from the sides, right, with with the flagpoles coming out. And what it says up there is this is, 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 the, is the small characters, Da Zhonghua Mingguo Wan Wan Sui. So, you know, long live the Republic of China. Because this is nineteen probably nineteen fifteen when this was done. Um, and then in, in like in, in the butterfly it says Zhongguo, China, right? Uh, and then below it says Guangdong, right? Right, and then the stele is Ai Chun Sha, which is probably like a name for the organization of of immigrants who were there. You know, the the Society for Love of the Multitudes, right? And then in 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 uh, uh, seal characters, Hua Kai Fu Gui, right? So so Hua Kai is like blooming flowers, wealth, and nobility, sort of wishes for the wishes for the future, and all of the rest of the characters are surnames. Of the, of, of the people who were being blessed by this, by this, uh, this thing. So it's really quite a, this is the top. Um, oh, actually, one other, one other thing to note. Oops, where'd it go? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's here. You know, this, this is a simplified version of Lu for Liu, six. So, so it's Si Liu Ji Nian, remembering April 6th. Because Qingming Festival is usually on April 5th, but it can also be on April 6th or April 4th because it follows the solar calendar, not the lunar calendar, right? So it can change a little bit. So, so this is essentially in, in, like in remembrance of Qingming Festival. That's what it says there. Okay, um, let's see. Let's go into Japanese inscriptions. Uh, and uh, as I, I, we already sort of went over some of this, so we won't say much. Uh, except to, to, to bring, that, bring it down to here, that the gentleman's agreement worked and, and Japanese were, picture brides were able to come through about 1920 when the process was stopped. They, they called that the ladies' agreement when they stopped. Uh, uh, but 
but they were not technically excluded like the Chinese were. Uh, but in uh, 1924, there was a brand new uh, immigra immigration policy set up based on quotas, right? And and so and and and, and one of the re one of the things that were in there is it, it said that uh, no one can immigrate unless they are eligible for naturalization. So since Jap Japanese were Asians, the Asians were not eligible. They were effectively excluded after this point, even though their name was mentioned. The name Japan was never mentioned, right? Right. Uh, that 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 act also was was uh, was aimed at a lot of different immigrant groups, right? Uh, uh, you know, we think we think of the Ellis Island experience when many Russian European uh, Russian uh, uh, Eastern European Jews came, uh, Italians came, Greeks came. They were not popular in the East Coast, right? Uh, and so, you know, you know, because what immigration meant to the mainstream American there and the Ameri ma mainstream American legislator was Northern Europeans, you know. If you come from England, Ireland was allowed, but the Ireland, Irish had a lot of hard times here too, right? Right? Uh, 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 but once you got to Italy, and, and, and the Southern Europeans and the, and the Eastern Europeans, there was some pushback. So one thing that the, uh, that the, the 1924 rule did is a set a quota system saying, well, you know, we will allow X numbers of, 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 of immigrants to come from any one country based on a percent, uh, per, uh, based on the percentage of people who are already here. So, so if there's a population of 20,000 from a country, they would take some percentage of that and allow new immigrants for that, right? But, but rather slyly, they backdated the whole thing, right? So it's not based on 1924. By 1924, there were many, many Italians, Greeks, Russian, Russian Jews, Eastern European Jews here, right? So they didn't want to use those numbers. So they backdated it to 1890. So in 1890, there were very few people from Russia, from you know Eastern Europe, or from Southern Europe here. So if it effectively slashed the number of immigrants who could come from those places, while allowing this numbers from Northern Europe to stay the same, or even get bigger, right? Right. So it's, it was really quite a uh, a trick. So anyway, uh, uh, as I say, most of these are, uh, are uh, more mundane, but mundane is good because often you get identifying information, and I was able to do, to, to do research on who the people were who wrote the inscriptions, right? This is, this is one of the earliest inscriptions, 1911, because it says Meiji 44, because that's the, almost the last year of the, I think 45 was the last year of Meiji. The Meiji emperor died then, right? And then on the other side, it's the, it's the third year of the Xuantong. The Xuantong period, that's the last emperor of China. If anybody has seen the movie about the last emperor, he was three years old when he became emperor, right? right. And then he, went, and he abdicated when he was six. You know? So, so that, those are together on the building. This is, this is one, one, one's really quite lovely. Um, this is uh, Miyamoto from Nukui District, Kawaguchi Village. Asa County, Hiroshima Prefecture, 45th year, 1912. Well, this is um, Masaro Miyamoto, right? I, I was able to get in touch with their, his, his descendants, right? So Masaro Miyamoto, and then this is his wife, uh, Kunio, uh, Kunio, right, on their wedding day in about 1920, 1918, 1919, something like that, right? Well, he and his, like, uh, he and his mother had come from Japan, and they were held there uh, for medical reasons for a couple weeks, and then they were let go. Uh, uh, his father, and you know, and his mother's husband, was a farmer in the Central Valley, right? Uh, 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 but he had actually, uh, Masaru had actually been born in Hawaii. Uh, in, unfortunately, though, his parents had gone to Hawaii using a fake name. They called themselves the Hokodas when they were there. So Miyamoto, as he got a little older, and he decided he wanted to be able to buy land, but there were alien land laws which prohibited Japanese from buying farmland, right? So he wanted to prove that he was a U.S. citizen, 
right? So he went back to Japan to try to get his birth certificate. He found out that it's in the name of Hokuda. It's not in the name of Miyamoto, right? So he said, oh, well, you know, I'll stay a Hokuda. And he, he remained a Hokuda for the, last, for the rest of his life, right? Um, but he was able to come back. He was, he was a legal U.S. citizen. Um, but here he is on his on wedding day. They were farmers in the Central Valley. And then he and his wife and their children, lovely children, uh, they uh, uh, relocated to Los Angeles where he had a gardening business, you know, uh, you know doing home landscaping, right? Uh, you know, and put his kids through school. Uh, uh, and then uh, during World War II, they were interned like the Japanese were. Uh, they were at Gila, Gila River in Arizona, although they were able to get out at the end to do work release. There, there was actually labor shortages around the country. So some Japanese were able to get out of the camps to go to certain places to work under supervision with farmers, right? right, um, And so on. Now, meanwhile, you know, they are in, they are in an internment camp. All three of their kids are in the US military. All three of their boys are in the US military. Right. One of them, right after the war, was actually was in Japan um, as, as a translator for the occupation. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and he was able to visit Hiroshima, you know, which was their home province, you know, soon afterwards to see the destruction. Another son was in Europe right after the war. He was a guard at the uh, at the uh, Nuremberg trials of the, all the Nazi war criminals. And the family still has, he has an autograph book. You know, so so he, would see, he would see these big Nazis you know, every day, and they would, but, they, they, but, you know, but then they would, he, he would trade them cigarettes if they would write in his book. You know, so he, he had this autograph book of all these major, <laughs> major Nazi war criminals. It's pretty amazing. Uh, so, so anyway, uh, it, it, so, so after, after the war, they came back and, and, li and lived in Los Angeles until retirement. And this, this, this was taken in the 19, uh, 1980s uh, uh, while, uh, while they were in a retirement home in Japantown in Los Angeles. Uh, a, 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 another part of this story, though, there's, there's some sort of ironic and sad turns to it, right? They were from Hiroshima. Now, if we go back here, right, they were from Hiroshima, but not from the city. They were from a, a small village outside. It was a farming village, quite well, quite well known for its vegetables, right? And it was called Kawauchi Village. It actually had originally been two villages. The Nikui Village was one, and Kawauchi was another. Then they merged, right? Well, uh, and, and, but they were well away from the Hiroshima city center. During World War II, though, in 1945, the local civil service corps from this village was called into the city to do demolition work, and they were all there at ground zero. So there were more than 200 people from this one village who were killed immediately, right? And so, so much so that this village ever afterward, afterwards was known as the Widow's Village. There's a monument to, to, to this village group in Peace Park in Hiroshima, right? Another really sad element to the story is that Masaru's youngest sister, born in California, right, had married another Japanese, I think either married a, Jap a, guy, a guy from Japan or married another Japanese immigrant and went back. They were living in near Hiroshima at his family's village. They, they'd gone in with their daughter that day to register for school and all three of them were killed, right? right. Uh, Kinyu's father had been a, a hardworking immigrant in, in California for 30 years. When he retired, he went back and he was killed. He was, he was going down to the railroad station and, and he was pulling a luggage cart. And all they found was the luggage cart. They never found him. Right? So it's, it's just, it just shows the interconnections right, of history and, and ordinary people. It's really quite astounding sometimes if you think about it. Yes? Um, yes. Is that supposed to end at two? Okay. I just wondered if you wanted to give yeah, well, a little... Yeah, why, why don't we stop here? You know, that, that's good. I, so, I, I could go on for a long, long time, but, but, I, but I tend to... We, 
really, really appreciate this talk. It's、uh, enrich our understanding. There was so many layer of thing, and enrich our one of the topics enrich our understanding of the complexity of the immigration and the story, untold story, particularly. Right. Right. So we want to open the floor for question. This is the precious chance opportunity for people here. Yeah, please. Whatever is on your mind. Whatever on your mind. How about the food fight? That's fascinating me too. I was wondering about this person you were just talking about because you said that he was living under a different name. So how was this person found? You know, and related to this inscription.、Uh, here's how it worked: is what、uh, I had a hard time doing it. I was able to do it by by matching immigration records, right? Like like.、Uh, I I I I could not find a Masaru Miyamoto anywhere. I found a Masaru Hokuda. I said, "Hmm, the dates match." And then I realized that the name, the, the surname of his mother, was the same. Right. So I had an inkling that Masaru Hokuda and Masaru Miyamoto were the same people. So I wrote a letter. I I found Masaru Hokuda's son's name and address. And I sent a letter, and the family wrote back and said, "What? <laughs> wow!" Because they knew didn't, they didn't know any of this stuff, you know. That that happened to me several times on this on this on this journey, because I was doing what I was doing is sort of reverse genealogy. Usually, when you do genealogy, you're starting from yourself and you're going backwards, right? Whereas what I was doing was starting from the inscription and trying to go forwards, right? And、uh, and in, in about you know. Eight or nine cases, I was able to reach living descendants of people, and then I was able to flesh out their entire stories in that way. It's really, really quite, quite, quite,、um, you know, moving. You know, the, here's an example of, of, of Jacob、uh, Zeitlin. You know, and then I got in touch. He changed his name to Jacob Allen, and I sort of found the whole story. And they supplied me with with his childhood photos and from key, from from.、Uh, Gomel in in Ukraine, you know the whole family in in you know in in, in Ukraine, and then you know coming coming to to America,、uh, Ermia Feingold or or became Jeremiah Feingold, and his brother living in San Francisco,、uh, he becomes a big uh, a big uh, uh, communist sympathizer and and rabble rouser, a union man. Ends up ends up getting arrested multiple times for for protests, you know, and then was was uh, under uh, uh, investigation by the House Un-American Activities Committee, committee. His his parents had died in the Holocaust, and so on. So you know, it's a it's a it's a long long story with a lot of. It took a long time to do. But there's a lot of joy in it. Because I was, in some cases, I was really help, able to help relatives who had no idea that their ancestors had gone through Angel Island. Please.、Um, I'm just really, really touched by the whole work and、mm. presentation. Thank you.、Um, so many things co is coming up, but I, you know, like it's history, but it's not that far. That it's still so recent. So it's relatable. Yeah.、Um, thank you so much、oh, for every the presentation for the research. So much that went into it. Thank you.、Um, thank you. I think my question is like you said something about deaconess. It's actually deaconess or de oh deaconess. Deaconess, yeah. Who is who is that? She, What's she, that? Well, she was a Methodist. Uh, 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 she was a missionary, I guess, but she really wasn't there to be doing missionary work. She was there. Because it was, she felt it was her duty as a Christian、uh, to, to provide social services for all these people who didn't have it, didn't have anything, and so you know she was able to help by bringing you know books and magazines and you know helping to to go between the immigration inspectors and the people to try to get them some more benefits. So over time, they did you know like there were. Some things to do. They had like a a game room where they could go, and they had the recreation yards and things like that. But she, but she was she was there pretty much the entire thirty years. She'd go every day, you know,、uh, 
uh, uh, to help, just to help people out. Did you say 30? About 30 years, yeah. Yeah, because the immigration station was 1910 to 1940, and then he, then comes the burning of the immigration administration building. And then it turns, it's turned over to the army. So it's all army during World War II. Interestingly about the army thing, I don't, I don't, I don't want to take much more time, but uh, I, said that, I said there were a lot of POWs who were there, right? Angel Island at the time was kind of a cover for a super secret intelligence operation that was run out of Tracy, California. You know, out in Tracy, there's what we call the Byron Hot Springs. Ever heard of that? It's like, if you go, if you go out there, you know, I like guess, you know, it's, it, it was a resort at one time, the Byron Hot Springs, right? Uh, but then it closed during the Depression. The Army took it over at the beginning of World War II, and they used it as an interrogation center for, for intelligence, intelligence gathering from POWs, right? And, and, they, they actually, and interestingly, in, in, in distinction with what happened here, in, during the Iran-Iraq war, where it was like hardball kind of interrogation, you know, waterboarding and all that sort of stuff, they used the soft touch. They treated people well. They gave, they gave them good food. They treated them nicely and just talked. And they got all sorts of amazing intelligence about Japanese uh, naval, naval uh, uh, weaponry and so on. It's really quite amazing. But, uh, Angel Island, essentially, uh, Tracy did not exist. It was only a POW, a PO, not PO, a PO box. It did not exist in the records. It was also t totally top secret, so that people would actually be listed as being in Angel Island, even though they were going back and forth between those places. Please. Um, thank you for this incredibly moving and touching work. And um, as a first generation um, Chinese immigrant, there's something about poetry and calligraphy that is so, it's, it touches the heart because it's really personal. And it almost like I could feel like through their calligraphy and their poetry, I can actually hear their voice. And so thank you for giving these people a voice. And um, my question is that, um, if you were to, you know, what message could we learn from your work today of all of the war and the refugee and all the people that are being displaced right now? Is there something that, you know, you could share that? Well, well I, I, th I think you've already put your finger on it. It's, it's that these issues haven't changed, right? So has America actually progressed very far in this, in, at least in this arena? We, all, we always think that things now are better than they were in the past, right? But but you know, you look back at this, and we see it. We see it repeating itself, right? Right. So you know, you you would think, you would hope, that there would be some more open-minded, more more humanitarian uh, approach to these problems. But it's there's there's still this constant struggle going on. You know, there 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 are there are rules in the books which are much more humanitarian now, and many of the many of the the, the immigration laws that that were that were done then, based on eugenics and so on, those are long gone, right? So that's an advance, but we still end up having the same kind of arguments. Whereas there are people who who want, want to welcome immigrants and treat them humanely and fairly, within the le within the legal bounds, and then there are people who just don't want to have anybody come, right? So I, so you know I, I I don't know if there's if there's um, there's uh, you know, hope for that to change that much, but at the least we can say that that uh, that that some of the rules and regulations are more enlightened than they used to be. Uh, okay. Hi. Thank you so much, Professor. I think there's not another way to look at statistics after this presentation. I think your life's work is completely priceless, completely precious. Thank you. Thank I think. You. I, I, I kind of had a question about like um, the numbers, the statistics, the macro currents of the geopolitical climate. Um, I think, but I think somehow just like each with each question that you've already answered, it already yeah. showed me the picture of the micro of the lived lives of those tossed, tossed around by the currents. And I, I just want to say I'm, 
I'm never going to be able to look at these events and these numbers like the same again. Oh, cool. well, I really, really appreciate it. It really hit in a very personal way. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, you know, everybody has a story. And so, that's, so I think that's what I was trying to do, is to try to tell as many stories as I could, you know, um, because they're so, everybody's different, but then, but then at the same time, all of these people who, who are sort of ordinary people, uh, many of them got caught up in these larger waves of historical change, you know, in so many ways. Uh, so it's a nice, nice perspective on the, ch you know, the, the, the vast changes in history in the last hundred years. We see how lucky we are. So. Yeah. Well, I think that's a lovely note to end on. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Egan, for sharing this. I can't believe that it's taken us this long to have you here visiting. Um, and I hope there'll be many more chances for you to come. Good. Um, if anyone wants to ask some more questions, I believe you're able to hang around for sure. a few more minutes sure. afterwards. Our IT team needs to wrap up. But um, thank you, everyone, for coming, especially the girls' school. Um, your energy is always very much appreciated. <laughs>